Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg. Welcome to Book Circle Presents and An Ever-Mounted Cavalry. Ivy has learned, along with her companions, the story of how the entire male half of the Fitzmichael family came to be drafted into the new cavalry of centaurs. And she has agreed to keep all of this secret. She's even agreed to be put under a magical oath that will make it stay secret. Fletcher turned back to Miss Blackhold. Meanwhile, you and I are to start packing for London. Yes, the least conspicuous method is the local bus to Oxford, where we can take the train to Paddington. London? Ivy asked. Why London? For the ghost markets, Fletcher answered. Pushed by nerves, Ivy laughed a little and asked, To buy ghosts? She saw Limney's aghast face. Miss Blackholt and Brother Eugene looked somber, and Lieutenant Fletcher's smile was wry. Even Melissa raised her eyebrows. You could? And Ivy remembered that Brother Eugene had told how Fitzsimmons was diligent to save his battle dead from necromancers. Yes, but you mustn't, Fletcher answered her. It's an unfortunate name, said Miss Blackhold, but it's what they've been called since long before ghost bottling became so common in the last century. Are they like sundered black markets? Ivy asked. Fletcher shrugged. They're not illegal. The unsundered government doesn't know they exist and wouldn't believe it if they heard of them. It's the name for anything sundered sold by sundered people in an unsundered place. Magical ingredients, spells, enchanted objects, magical services, what you could call imports. We are going to get those hoof trimmings we were talking about just now, Miss Blackwell explained. You were? asked Fletcher. Then you'd better put all that under the secrecy oaths, too, along with Limney's business. Your family has these spells as royal patents, and they are military secrets. Miss Blackhold nodded. Ivy decided that a secret about hoof clippings was pretty small change at this point. She picked up her notebook and added ghosts and ghost selling to her list of discoveries. By the time the vanguard men arrived, Miss Blackhold and Fletcher had worked out what everyone's secrecy oaths were to be. Except for Ivy, they had written them out, then read them aloud, all starting with, I swear by my name, then burning them. Presumably magic was going on, but Ivy noticed nothing. Ivy's oath was written out and put in an envelope so she could swear to it in front of Father Neil without him having to hear any details. I swear by my name to keep the promise written in this letter. Father Neil and all the other vanguards turned out to be men in ordinary suits and coats. While the others muttered together about Limney's transport arrangements and conditions Miss Blackhold and Fletcher were likely to face in London, Father Neil quizzed Ivy on her understanding of the Sundering, Grand Normandy, and Oaths. He was polite and cheerful in an impersonal way that made her think of her dentist back home. The only hitch had been that she was not sure of her baptismal name. My full name is Ivy Alice Treadwell, was all she could tell him. Well, we'll suppose Ivy Alice to be your baptismal name. Were you baptized? I suppose so. Uh, we're C of E, sort of. Ivy wondered if Father Neil was Church of England, or Catholic, or something else. He nodded and said, Alice is a popular name in Grand Normandy. We're quite fond of St. Alice, of whom Ivy had never heard. It's after a great-grandmother in my case, she admitted. He just nodded again. He then put his hands on her head and said, I, Fraser Alex Edward, do consecrate you, Ivy Alice, to swearing truly by your true name, by my authority as a son of Adam to name truly. Ivy did not feel any different. That's it? Yes, make your oath now. So she did, holding the sealed envelope, which she then burned. He smiled, nodded, stood up, and shook her hand. Shortly after that, the vanguard and Limney left. 
Ivy noticed her grown-ups being fairly cordial as they bade him goodbye. She supposed they appreciated his loyalty to the Fitzmichaels. She could see the point. So she shook his hand and said, I hope it goes well for you, which had to be safely free of detail. He thanked her soberly. Fletcher left for the Peas Blossom pub to pack. Melissa and the bees left for the hives. Brother Eugene and Ivy watched Miss Blackholt pack a satchel like a doctor's bag, mostly with bottles, but with occasional buttons, scraps of cloth, bandages, and bits of twine. How long will you be gone? Ivy asked, a very practical question that had somehow not yet come up. Two to four days, Miss Blackholt answered, depending on how smoothly things go. That is an estimate. She turned to the old monk. Brother Eugene, if things go wrong and we do not come back in a reasonable time, you must contact the vanguard and the majory. Yes, Lieutenant. Is the seeming holding up? Yes, Lieutenant. Of course, I've been careful not to eat or drink anything, but I never get more than a few seconds' notice. It would be worthwhile improving that. Good. Each of these bottles, she indicated two shelves of little clear bottles on a small wall cabinet, holds a dose of the human seeming potion. Each of these, she pointed to the next row of bottles, is antidote. I suppose you could just eat something, but the timing of the change is less predictable then. Thank you, that should be plenty. Do you have a good idea of where to go for these hoof clippings? Oh yes, my uncle has arranged it all, but now he won't be going to London himself until we can make the seemings more reliable. We are going to the same people who told us how to contact the Desalonians. The Crown Agents Paddington Station was quite busy. You can hardly tell it was bombed, Miss Blackholt remarked as they exited. Fletcher nodded and whistled the opening of London Pride. London Pride has been handed down to us. London Pride is a flower that's free. London Pride means our own dear town to us, and our pride it forever shall be. A passing woman smiled at him. Let us hope our nation can be as resilient, Miss Blackholt said. Fletcher smiled. If we can secure ourselves a cavalry of super soldiers, that will be a big step in the right direction. He began scanning the traffic. So did Miss Blackholt. Even though that cavalry is just a cover to hide dynastic tomfoolery, she asked a little bitterly. Even though... What do you think Prince Hugh would have done with the centaurs if he hadn't been changed? Just put them out to pasture, or founded the cavalry anyway, just not as a member? Or at least organized them into a special strike team? She sighed. Not the pasture, I'm sure. Except for the likes of Brother Eugene for age, and the ones driven mad. Your enemy can give you a present even while attacking you. Fortunes of war. Miss Blackhold nodded, even while continuing to scan the traffic. There's one, she said. I think, she added. Is that a bell on the side? It's very small. Fletcher squinted at the cab she was pointing at. I think so. Worth a try. He waved and tried to make eye contact. Miss Blackhold did the same, but the cab made no change, of course. Damn it, Fletcher growled, then put two fingers in his mouth, whistled piercingly, and yelled, Hey, Nelrach! Bell wagon. The cab jerked as the driver tapped the brakes, then slowed and sidled over to the curb. Fletcher pulled open the door and hopped in after Miss Blackhole. What the hell are you doing ailing a cab in Elvish? demanded the driver, a short, stocky man with vivid green eyes. Establishing what kind of fares we are, Fletcher answered cheerfully. He glanced at the driver's license. Tybalt Whittington. So the cab with a discreet little bell on the side was not only owned by the Whittingtons, this one was driven by one, all the better. Give my regards to the thrice mayor. Mr. Whittington snorted as he inserted the cab in a passing gap in the traffic. You won't hear through me very fast. We're some kind of fourth cousins twice removed. You don't think the mayor's family drives cabs, do you? Where to? Canary Wharf, Miss Blackholt answered. Right you are. He spun the wheel and sent the cab dodging through an incipient clot of congestion, but left his hand hovering in front of the glove compartment. Since you wanted a Nalrach, 
I take it you have no objection to feline company? No allergies or the like? Of course not. No objection at all. Right. Whittington opened the glove compartment, and a black cat flowed out. It looked about briefly, then hopped up on the back of the passenger seat to gaze at the Grand Normans with eyes the same color as its master's. Well, its keeper's. It was small, perhaps half-grown. This here's Baudrins. He rides shotgun for me. How do you do, Baudrins, said Miss Blackhole. A pleasure, said Fletcher. Baudrins favored them with the slow blink that is a feline smile. He then made himself comfortable on the narrow perch of the seat back and surveyed the passing cityscape, mostly through the back window. I popped him away just before I picked you up. Habit, really. I lets him out once I know the fares is sundered. Of course, you advertise that ahead of time. He helps spot fares and trouble, and mostly he keeps me company. A very nice arrangement, Miss Blackholt said. Going shopping, Whittington asked. That's what sundered folk going to Canary Wharf usually means. True enough, Fletcher agreed without saying yea or nay. Because I can help you find most things you might be looking for. Oh, we know our destination, Miss Blackholt assured him. Where's that? You can drop us off at, Fletcher began. Eee! chattered Baudrins, glaring out the back window. What? Miss Blackholt began. He sees something he don't like, or a real choice pigeon. Whittington stared intently into the rearview mirror, following the cat's gaze. Eee! Baudrins repeated. He hoisted his hindquarters up on the back of the seat, and despite the narrowness of the space, did his best to execute the ready-aim-fire butt-wiggle. Fletcher watched Whittington watch the mirror. I take it we're not being followed by a really choice pigeon. By two blokes on bikes. Think they showed up out of an alley right after I picked you up. Fletcher leaned over to look in the side mirror. Miss Blackle produced a compact from her black bag and looked, at, looked in it over her shoulder. Bicycles were common in a nation laboring under petrol rationing, faster than foot, more maneuverable than cars, and so a tempting choice for those who would tail others. Now, two men were drifting three cars behind them on bicycles. They did not look like they were pursuing, but simply laboring through traffic. Both were rather fair. One was large and raw-boned. The other, there was nothing. Otherwise, there was nothing remarkable about them. Okay, said Whittington, I need to know what kind of fight I'm in. Who are you and who's them? There was silence for a few seconds while the Grand Normans raced their brains. Whittington lost patience. Come on, come on. You Greenwood? Are they Greenwood? Grand Normandy? Irish Empire? Sherwood? One of the Bourbons? Something private? I need to know sides or I need you out of this cab. Grand Normandy, Fletcher cried. We're Grand Normans on crown business. I swear it by my name and my honor as a soldier. And I swear it by my name and my honor as a soldier, Miss Blackhold added. We are allies. Both soldiers, eh? Tell him. The cabbie jerked his thumb at his cat, who had settled down to a long-term filthy look out the back. Baudrins, asked Miss Blackhold. Tell him what? He don't know politics, but tell him your friends. I'll see if he believes you. She leaned over into Baudrin's face. His ears went down at the familiarity. Baudrin's, we want to be friends. Baudrin's, said Fletcher from a few inches further away, we need to hide or run. Please help. Baudrin's gave both of them a disgusted look, hopped into the back seat, then climbed up behind them to get an unobstructed view. His tail lashed both of them impartially. <coughs> Miss Blackholt turned back to Whittington. Is there some other proof? She began. Nah, you're good. If he was sour on you, he'd have crawled under the seat or something. Okay, so you're Grand Norman, or at least friendly. Who's them? I don't know, Fletcher said. I'm afraid they're on an Arab agents, though if we're lucky, they're just Greenwood. Why'd Greenwood be after you? Wouldn't they be after you? Fletcher asked Whittington. Nah, they don't bother with cabbies. Smuggling and magic gang fights is what they're down on us for. On an herb, it is then. Don't worry, we'll shake these krauts and get you to Canary Wharf. No, change of plan. Why, what? asked Miss Blackhold. Unless our luck is amazingly bad, the only reason they'd have been at Paddington to meet us would have been that someone interested in our work saw us leave home. Fear no, she exclaimed. Debo grieveth. 
Hell, devil take it, she went on in this vein. Whittington chuckled. Shenoway's cousin, now I believe you're Grand Norman. Where to if it ain't Canary Wharf? The British Museum, Fletcher ordered. Right. The cabbie flipped around a corner without warning. Now we'll see. If they follow, that they give themselves away, and that shows they know we know. Vaudrins stared out the back window without comment. The humans watched rearview mirrors. No cyclists showed up. Good enough, said Whittington. But three blocks and a turn later, one of them showed up two cars behind them, the larger of the two cyclists. Blast! He guessed our direction. And he's quite the wheelman, Fletcher observed, peering into the side mirror. We made good time those last two blocks. He has to have put on quite a burst of speed to catch up, but he isn't even breathing hard. He looked at Miss Blackhold. Something in your line? Possibly, but... She stopped looking through her compact mirror and stared vaguely for a few seconds. He's not running anything just now. I'll show you running, declared Whittington. We're gonna lose this Jerry. He slipped over one lane, which looked like a bad move since it slowed them down, but five seconds later the cyclist went rolling past them, stuck in the faster lane. A quarter minute later, the cab was back in the first lane, then made another zero-notice turn down an alley that looked to have been measured to fit it. Baudrins fell into Fletcher's lap. Pay attention, Whittington growled to him. Baudrins decided this was best done by climbing onto his human's shoulder. Whittington had been using trickery rather than speed until now, but in two more conventional turns they were in another alley, and he shot down this for four blocks at a patently illegal speed that it would have been disastrous if anything at all had happened to be in the way. But nothing happened to. The two Grand Normans sat rigid and silent, admiring with the bits of attention they could spare from dreading. Fletcher could tell that Whittington was using dim glows and tiny flickers of magic, but could only guess what he was up to. Miss Blackholt's more finely honed perceptions saw that he was managing his luck with glimpses of foresight and short-term prescience, and occasionally redlining his own reflexes. There, said Whittington as they settled into a normal flow of traffic, that ought to settle his sauerkraut. Now, I can't promise he won't douse for us, because he seems to have some mojo going for him, but we at least ought to have some breathing room, and it's bad conditions for Dawson. I could ward against that, Miss Blackholt said, but that might interfere with your own work, Mr. Whittington. I don't think we want to do that, said Fletcher. I'll scrub our trail when we have the time, said Whittington. I have a black cat cross our path. He scratched Baudrin's ears and smiled. He can earn his keep. Without further incident, they arrived at the British Museum. Good enough? Whittington asked, pulling up in front. More than enough, said Fletcher. Excellent, said Miss Blackhold. She opened her black bag and rummaged. Now, just give us a moment before we disembark. She pulled out two lengths of silk, arm long, colorless, nearly transparent. After carefully inspecting the corner of one, she handed it to Fletcher and started winding the other one around her own neck. Tuck it out of sight, she told him, but leave some little edge visible. It's necessary. A second later, she had her own scarf wrapped in position. As Fletcher wrapped his, her image wobbled and rippled. Fletcher's did the same moments later. Whittington laughed. It's been a fair time since I seen glamour that good. A young man sat, or appeared to sit, where Miss Blackholt had been and a tall young woman sat in Fletcher's position. Neither image resembled the original. "'You didn't adjust height?' asked Miss Fletcher in a perfectly feminine voice. "'No,' Blackholt answered in tenor. The added complexity would have made the spell more fragile. Miss Fletcher looked at the fair and gave Whittington double. After they got out, she put out her hand to shake Whittington's. At the last moment, she changed the grip to a ladylike clasp of fingers only. Thank you. Confusion to our enemies. Many thanks, said Black Holt, slipping a dose of vis through the handshake as another kind of tip. Good luck to you. He moved Baudrons from his shoulder to the passenger seat, nodded as he rolled up the window, and slid into the traffic. Who do we meet at the British Museum? Black Holt asked. 
No one, Miss Fletcher answered, but it's conveniently near the contact point I want to use, and this way we make it one step harder to follow us there. Waiting for a chance to cross the street gave them opportunity to check for unwanted cyclists or people who looked like them. Then it was across the street, around the corner, across the next street, and so on at a leisurely pace that let any tailors re reveal themselves. None did. They approached a pub. If there is a barkeep or barmaid wearing a green vest, said Miss Fletcher, I, ask, I could ask to use the phone and contact the vanguard. Blackholt opened the door for Miss Fletcher. The pub was small, dark, plain, but clean. The barkeep wore a green vest. There were only three other people in it, a man at one end of the bar and a couple at the table. Blackholt followed Miss Fletcher to the bar where they sat at the far end from the lone man. The barkeep asked for their order. There was a tiny pause while Blackholt remembered to do the ordering. Two pints, please. Miss Fletcher then said, My cousin told me you have a phone customers can use. The barkeep confirmed this and, after delivering their pints, placed a phone before Miss Fletcher. Clear, he said. Miss Fletcher nodded, picked up the receiver, and dialed zero. The barkeep busied himself elsewhere. Put me through to Major Cruis's office, please, Miss Fletcher said, then, after a pause, went on in Chenelais. Lieutenant Fletcher, sir, assigned to the Oswick Field Lab, calling from London. Yes, sir, speaking under glamour. Yes, sir, seventeen thirty fifteen. Yes, sir, we were tailed from Paddington, sir. Miss Fletcher went on to describe subsequent events, named Tybalt Whittington, and pointed out that being met by a tail probably meant the Oswick lab was under observation. There followed a lot of listening, punctuated with occasional yes-sirs and no-sirs, hanging up on a final yes-sir. Well, said Miss Fletcher to Blackholt, we've done what we can. The cavalry, so to speak, is off to the rescue. Drink up, then off to Canary Wharf. Two cab rides, more prosaic than the first, and a brisk walk brought them to Canary Wharf. Specifically, it brought them to an unassuming little dock where sat a small sailboat, the Lucene. Use of the dock came with the use of a small hut, or shack. In this hut, behind a third-hand desk, sat a short, graying man writing letters, who called, Come in, when they waved at him through the window. Mr. Wentle, asked Blackholt, I come representing my uncle, Dr. Edward Blackholt. He looked at Blackholt, registered a little confusion, and said, I was told to expect Miss Claudine Blackholt. And we were told, said Blackholt with a pleasant smile, that you could see further into a millstone than most. Ah, hmm. He stared at them. Many years ago, he had purchased a very expensive eye ointment. Many fays used it on the eyes of their rare offspring so that these babies would not be taken in by glamour before they had learned the art of it. Mr. Wentel had never regretted the investment. Ah, yes, I see. It was like looking through a spyglass with both eyes open. You had to learn which vision to heed. And you, miss, uh, sir, he said to Miss Fletcher. I am with the Grand Norman Vanguard, Lieutenant James Fletcher, said Miss Fletcher, and I will swear to that by my name and my honor. Mr. Wentel paused as if listening for something, then said, very good. Miss Blackholt then swore too, and he nodded. He then opened a drawer of his desk and spoke into it. Shall we proceed? No reason not to, piped a voice, and out hopped a small figure. It looked something like a monkey and something like a cat, though gray-skinned and tailless, and equipped with ears large enough for a horse. It wore clothes that had started as a sailor suit for a large doll, though now drained of color, and it carried a burlap bag the size of a man's head. Here's the goods, it said. Let's see the cash. You can call me Jib, by the way. He is the Lucene Gremlin, Mr. Wentel explained. And he is your backup, thought Miss Blackholt, reflecting with satisfaction that Ivy and Brother Eugene had Melissa and her folk for their own fairy backup. 
and we will continue this game of magical espionage next time.